So that's our call to awake and our call to begin. So good morning, everybody. My name is Tawana Kane. Uh, welcome to Overcoming Obstacles in Your Teaching Environments in Schools. Um, we're just going to do a brief introduction of ourselves and then we're going to jump right into it. So again, I'm Tawana. Um, and I was thinking a little bit about how to introduce myself today. Uh, and one of my teachers, um, Sharon Salzberg, talks a lot about the Lucy self. And there's this Charlie Brown cartoon where Lucy's looking at Charlie Brown and she has her hands on her hips and she says, you know, Charlie Brown, the trouble with being you is that you're you, <laughs> right? So it's like the trouble with my whole self is me, right? My whole, like, um, this inner critic that we like to nurture in ourselves. And so I feel like one of my call to duties is just to help people quiet that Lucy voice a little bit, to quiet that inner critic and just connect with their possibility in whatever way that means. So for young people, it's like connecting with their possibility, their future. I live in Baltimore City. Um, and I do work in Baltimore and beyond, but I have a keen focus on that city because I love it so much. Um, and our youth there are faced with blue lights, police lights flashing in their faces 24 hours a day. You know, they're faced with living next door to abandoned homes. They come to school hungry. They go home and they cook dinner for their younger siblings because their mother is not home. So they have a lot of challenges. It's hard when your head is in a hole to connect with possibility. And so I really just want them to connect with something bigger than themselves. That's why I offer them yoga. That's why I offer them mindfulness. Um, my organization, uh, because I think we're supposed to say something like that, is the Inner Resources Project. Um, but again, it's really just allowing people to connect with their hearts, connect with their own humanity, and just create a little bit more compassion and empathy and just make you, you Lucy, quiet down. So thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Allison Morgan. Um, the name of my company is Sensational Kids. I started in this journey of um, bringing yoga and mindfulness to youth, first working with the special needs population because I'm an occupational therapist. So I came to my work with youth um, as an OT first and um, found that these practices, I love, I love the word that you use of possibility. Um, the word that I like to use of what we offer is potential of always seeing the potential um, and the population that I work with a lot of people don't see the potential just saw the disability um, so what we do now is we bring um, yoga and mindfulness mostly to schools that's the biggest part of the population that we serve is in schools not only for a special needs population for it, but the entire general population of schools uh, we have um, in-class services that we provide and a lot of training. We do trainings across the country, but focused on, um, on schools, of how do we help kids that are, that are in schools, not only special needs, but in general. Um, the other thing that we do is we offer radiant child yoga teacher trainings so that our instructors have a basis by which a foundation to work off of, um, which has greatly helped us manage many of the obstacles that we have in the classrooms and um, yeah I think that's about that's about it yeah. doesn't sound like yeah, there we go now we're there good morning everyone welcome it's great to see you I see some some few familiar familiar faces from last year um, yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Joni. <laughs> um, I'm Gail Silver, and I'm in from Philadelphia, where I live with um, my husband and three children and a dog and a cat, a relatively unkempt home that I'm trying to come to terms with, and an organization called Yoga Child, which I founded in 2002, shortly after retiring from being a child advocate attorney for the Public Defender's Office of Philly. Um, 
When I founded Yoga Child, it was really for the purpose of, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret that's not so much a secret. I'm happy to share this, that um, while I really, I loved working with my clients, my child clients, um, as a child advocate, I found the system to be very difficult to work in and I was unable to serve my clients as I wanted to um, with, the, with some of the restrictions of the system. and. I, I didn't think I was, this is the part that I'm sort of sharing, this, this is the secret. I didn't think I was a fantastic lawyer, but I, I did believe that I was pretty good at reaching, reaching my clients and communicating with them and recognizing what they needed. And at the time, I was also an adult yoga teacher. And so, so you can sort of see naturally how those two worlds would, would come together. And it made sense for me to, to make the shift and, and establish Yoga Child. So this was in 2002. And since then, Yoga Child has been bringing yoga and mindfulness to children in Philadelphia schools, um, charter schools, public schools, private schools. Oh, it just got a little louder, didn't it? And, um, and we've we've been having we've been having a lot of success. We've we've had a we've had years where the climate was more dry, where it was more difficult for us to serve our clients, and then we've had years where funding was very very generous, and we were able to reach a lot of children. So we've really moved with the times over the years. Um, during that time, Yoga Child also operated as a yoga studio, a yoga center in Philadelphia for about ten years, and we were serving children, families, pregnant women, couples getting ready to have babies, adults, all kinds of, all kinds of offerings. And um, a few years ago, we sold the studio to the Yoga Garden in Narbreth, and we continue to host our Yoga Child teacher trainings out of that facility. And um, Yoga Child today continues as the organization that it originally was to bring yoga and mindfulness to children in schools and um, to educate educators, teacher trainings, professional development, pretty much everything that you hear all of us, all of us here are, are trying to do to serve our communities. But during that time, I also um, delved much deeper into the study of mindfulness and in trying to help my, um, my own children come to terms with some difficult issues in their lives. I found myself to be an author of children's books, and you may or may not be familiar with them, but if you would like more information about them, we do have a table over there. Um, the books are the Anz Anger, Ch Anz Anger children's book trilogy, including um, Anz Anger, Steps and Stones, and Peace, Bugs, and Understanding, which were written to provide children with um, a, a, a sort of a, a, a pictorial way of taking mindfulness into their lives, something that they can reclaim to help them navigate their difficult emotions. I always think back to when, um, when I was a child and my favorite, my favorite children's books. And I, what I always remember first are the illustrations before I remember the lesson and the language of the story. So I wanted to take these teachings of mindfulness and, and make them into something that children could grasp onto and take with them through their adult lives so that they didn't have to sort of struggle to learn how to be mindful as an adult as I was trying to do. <laughs> and um, I think that brings us to current day. And I will, um, I think I'm going to send this back your way, Tawana. Yeah, are we? It's, no, I think I, I think it's still with me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll just take a moment to um, kind of join together as a group. Um, I'll sound the singing bowl, and we can all maybe, if it feels good for you, close your eyes, and just allow yourself to um, maybe let anything that's calling to you pass, just sort of pass through. So, so you're just sort of with the sound of the bowl. And then just stay with that sound as long as your attention will allow you to. And when you no longer hear the sound, I invite you to open your eyes. It's always interesting to see how everyone opens their eyes at different times. If the sound is the sound, it's either going or it's not, but some of us are still, still hearing it. I always like to see how that plays out. 
So I think, um, we, just to sort of give you an overview of how we're going to spend our time together today, we're each going to share um, our, our overriding sort of um, teaching philosophy as to how we manage ourselves as teachers. And then we're going to share um, a common obstacle that we all face and how we, the tools we use to overcome that obstacle. Then we're going to go on a little journey, do a little exercise. And then we will have time for um, questions and answers and sharing, and we'll want to hear from, from each of you if you want to share. So with that being said, now I'm going to pass things back down this way, and we'll get to hear Tawana's lovely voice again. <laughs> so um, I should clarify a little bit. Um, I, I am primarily a, an MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness um, teacher, um, and I'm also a yoga instructor, uh, but I find that the vehicle that I use primarily in my work in schools is mindfulness-based. So just a little bit of clarification on my part from my lofty introduction of self earlier. Um, so we're talking about how we approach a class. Um, so I, I tend to work um, on research studies. Um, which means that there's a little bit more fidelity to a model that we have to adhere to um, in order to sort of maintain the research protocol. So um, our process is sometimes a little bit different, but it generally looks like this. A few weeks before we go into a school, we bear witness. We go inside the school, we notice what it smells like, we notice what we hear, we notice the faces of the children, the staff, and the teachers. We sit in on the classrooms that we're going to serve. And we just look. We let the teachers know we're not here to judge. We just want to see. And of course, we can't quite call it bearing witness. But we say, we're here to do some observations. We want to know about you. It really informs how we deliver. It informs how we approach. It informs our content. And it really helps us, when times get difficult, to remember what they're facing, sort of what their day-to-day -day life is like. So we try to do that somewhere between two and three hours in about half an hour increments for the first few weeks before we start our program. So we have that bearing witness process. Then we interview the teachers. We have a list of questions that we ask. What difficulties do you face in your classroom? What do you think something like yoga or mindfulness can do in your classroom? Are there any behavior management processes that you already have that you, want us, that you want to tell us about? We don't ask about the students specifically that they're having difficulty with. We don't ask specifically about like how on edge they are, but we just want to get a sense of how we can be helpful and how do they see their environment. And then a few weeks later, after we sort of go through a process of refining our curriculum to make it really specific for that school, we go in with a team of teachers. Uh, I engage in a co-teaching process. One, because I think it's really helpful for young people to see modeled how healthy adult interaction occurs. And so we always have two teachers in a classroom together. Uh, with those two teachers, uh, they go in, they support each other, and then you have someone to debrief with afterwards. So the day that we teach, we sit as a collective. And we do just like Gail did at the beginning. We ring a bowl. We sit for a little while together in silence, and we just get clear on what we're here to do. What's our intention? Is it to make people sit on mats? Uh, is it to make people sit on cushions? No, that's not what we're there for. We're there to connect them with their possibility. We're there to see them. We're there to hear them. And so if we just keep connecting with that basic intention, of course we do a little bit of like reviewing of lesson plans that often go out the door, but we primarily spend our time settling and centering ourselves and making sure we're clear about what we're trying to do. We go into the classroom and all sorts of things happen and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. But after each session, we come together again. We might journal for a little while. We fill out any reports. What happened in the class? What are you concerned about? Do we need to connect a child with a social worker, a psychologist? Do we need to check in with their teacher afterwards? We make sure that we know what happened, that there's a written record of it, and we know how we're gonna proceed the next time we go in. And then we offer ourselves just a little bit of loving kindness. So I wanna back up for a second. We close every single class with the metta practice, the loving kindness practice. That's how we'll close this session today too. 
Um, so we end with the children in that way, and then we come back and we give some more to ourselves. And we say, okay, where did Lucy show up for us today, right? When did Lucy tell us we weren't a good teacher, we weren't present enough, we weren't um, able to listen well enough, we got frustrated, we showed anger. When did that happen? And how can we sort of work with that the next time it occurs? So we really engage a process from before we start until the end of the class, and we do that every single session so that we make sure that we not only care for the people we're trying to serve, but we care for our teachers as well. So I think that how um, we, we started with schools primarily has changed a lot over the years. Um, in the beginning, we were just so happy to be invited in. It's like anywhere we, in, we were invited, we were like, yes, we'll go and we'll be here um, and we'll do our thing. And we were just so excited. And um, this is sort of talking about my philosophy, but also an immediate obstacle that happened was that a yogic philosophy in school is very, very different than educational philosophy. And we found that how we work with students in particular, and how we view students as being full of potential and possibility is not always how they're viewed in the educational system. And um, even though we were very lofty and just wanting to go everywhere whenever we were asked, um, what we learned is that there's two things that are really important is one, knowing why the school wants us there. What is their, what is their expectation? Um, because in the beginning it was sort of like, oh, here's just like an extra really fun thing for the kids to do. They really didn't understand what it was possible for us to bring and what we were really offering. So that them not understanding uh, us not understanding what their expectation was and them not understanding what was possible through yoga created a great mismatch there. Um, so now one of the things that we always start with with a school is identifying what is it that they want from us. Um, and what's very interesting is very often they don't know. We're at this point in, um, especially in yoga for schools, where you know the word is getting out there and there's a lot of schools that are just excited, like, yes, we should be doing this too. And I actually had a school, um, we've been back and forth over the last couple of months, like they want me to come, they want me to come, they want me to come, and finally I sat them down and I was like, well, why? What is it that you want? Because the way that they were viewing what we would do was really not in line with how we want to offer yoga in schools. Um, so our philosophy is truly about, about seeing the possibility. And in being able to see the possibility, you have to be able to see the child for who they are, as they are, where they are. And in order to be able to do that, you need to let them be. Like we're offering all of this wonderful stuff, um, but we need to be able to give them the space to receive it and integrate it as, as they are ready. And sometimes that ain't so pretty. And you have to be able to leave the space for that. Um, so the second thing that we always make sure of before we start programming in a school is that whoever's room we're in, they understand what our role is and how we manage. We call it like how we manage behavior because um, in schools they're very much about, okay, if there's mats, they will everybody stay on your mat and you have to be turned the same way. And if everybody's arms up, we're like, get your arms up, get your arms up. Um, <laughs> So um, schools understand that as like, it's just their behavior. We're just managing their behavior. Um, so we let it be known that we are going to, we're gonna handle some of the things very differently than you typically would. And we just ask that while we're in your room, just, just let, us. let us, let us lead. And if we really need you to intervene, we'll have like a little signal. Like if something really gets out of, 
gets out of control, but we really want to just let the child process things as naturally as they can, the way that feels good to them. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time, but the other thing that I'm going to add with, with that is that in order for us to be able to do that, to like let some things go and let kids really be who they are as they are, is that we need to know who we really are and we need to be really, really grounded. Um, and one of the things that, um, that we really follow, and this is from Radiant Child Yoga, is you are the yoga that you bring. Yoga is not something that we do, it's who we are. So we really need to embody that and carry that energy into every single place that we go. Um, so that's a really, really important, important piece of, um, of, of what we do and in, in sensational kids of, of how we start with schools. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, you know, when we had our first, when Tawana and Allison and I had our first phone call back in, um, I think it was May, and we were... So preparing for an hour and a half, just so you know, it takes about six or seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was our first, first time all on the phone together, and we were mapping out how we were going to best bring all of this information we wanted to share to you today. And I, somewhere in the, in the, you know, towards the end of the conversation, we sort of had an outline together, and I think it was... I think it was Allison, but correct me if I'm wrong, it may have been you, Tawana, I know it wasn't me, um, who said, we should, we should begin by really sharing a brief statement of sort of our philosophy as to how we manage ourselves as teachers. And I thought, oh, that sounds really nice, and I wrote it down on my, you know, very composed outline and a lot of the amount, proper amount of time for that, and, and then I thought, oh, wait, I better get a philosophy as to how I manage myself as a teacher, and I better do it by September. Um, and then, of course, a few weeks later, I sat down to, to sort of write up some notes about my philosophy on how I manage myself as a teacher. And, and I encourage all of you to do this after, the, you know, at some point when, when you, after you leave here today, because what I found is that I, I didn't have five minutes of information to share with you. I had about five days worth of information to share with you. And, and Allison and Tawana can attest to that when they saw, when we shared our notes going back and forth. I think Allison said, you know, we're... Anyway, I'm, I don't want to take us down a side road because we may never get back. But I, um, there is a, there is a, there's a lot that goes in, in, into managing myself as a teacher. And there's so much I want to share about that. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm going to sort of peel back the layers and get to the essence of my philosophy, sort of the two, the two silver threads that are woven through everything I do whenever I prepare to teach and whenever I'm in the classroom and then when I'm leaving the classroom as well. But um, as I, before I say that, I just want to let you know that um, what I, the parts that I don't share with you are all written up anyway, and I will be posting them if you're interested on um, the Yoga Child Facebook page post-conference. I always sort of post some goodies, so some of those things may not be in the handout, and if you're interested in hearing more about it, you can find it there um, in the coming weeks. But getting back on track. So the, these two, they're, re they're really simple, these, these two notions. And, um, it may be something some of you would do already. The first one is this, um, I'll call it a mantra, even though it's really more of a question, um, that I'm always asking myself, always asking myself when I prepare and when I'm in the classroom. And that is, what is my purpose in being here and am I meeting that purpose? What is my purpose in being here and am I meeting that purpose? Asking myself that question keeps me on track. Um, it, it keeps me on track, especially during those difficult moments or really challenging days. Those days when you wonder, did I make the right choice being a children's yoga teacher? Or those days when any number of the things that are obstacles and challenges that are on the board behind me are arising. Um, or those days where I might start to have self-doubt. Um, those days where, well, all days, right? It's with me all days. And the answer for me is, 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 is pretty straightforward. And I'd like to start by telling you what it's not. Um, my purpose is not to see my students in tree pose. It's not for, 
you know, it's, it's not for, it's not for me to get through my meticulously and gorgeously crafted lesson plan, even though that would be lovely too, right? That's a goal. A goal is different than a purpose. Um, my purpose is to teach my students how to use their mind, their body, and their breath together to help themselves feel better. That's it. How to use their mind, their body, and their breath together to help themselves feel better. It's a very similar concept to what I would teach when I'm teaching women how to prepare to give birth mindfully. These three things taken together are, are what mind-body education is. And when I, when I follow that path, the things that might seem important or might be distractions in class fall away. And I know I'm doing the work that I set out to do. And I'm motivated. And I'm excited. And I know that I'm not just giving them the, these tools to, I don't want them to just use their mind, body, and breath to feel better in the classroom before me. But I want them to take that with them when they leave to go to lunch recess or when they go back to the classroom and it's loud and the teacher is, maybe isn't as in control of the classroom as the yoga teacher is of the yoga space, or when they get on the bus to go home, or when they get home and they face other challenges. That's my purpose. And keeping sight of that um, really keeps me on track. Um, am I meeting that purpose was sort of that second question that I had posed, and that is where the other four days and 23 hours and 55 minutes come into play, and that, um, that's all about engaging, how I, how I like to engage my students and how I like to get them to a place where they want to hear what I have to say and want to respect me because once I have their respect um, and their trust then then you know then the rest is easy um, but that's that will all be on the on the on the Facebook post if you're interested but I did promise you a second silver thread today and the other one is that um, and this is, I would, this is very personal to me, and it may not apply to you, but if it doesn't apply to you, I hope that by the end of our time today, it does apply to you. And if you read more about it in the handouts that we provided, it will be something you can carry into your rooms if you don't already. And that is that I, um, in order to teach um, confidently and capably, I need to feel as though I'm in a teachable learning environment, an environment that's conducive to educating my students. So I go to great lengths to lay down what we call rules or boundaries and to set up actions or consequences for when those rules or boundaries are not honored. And it's something that we do our first class and we may do every class for so long as needed. Every time a new student joins the group, these are there for two reasons, really. One is that because our students need, our children, you, I mean, if you don't know this, this is definitely something to write down, but I'm sensing you're all here and you all already do know this, but I sort of abide by this in my home life and in, in my professional life, is that children need boundaries to feel safe. And they need you to honor those boundaries in order to trust you. So if you set up the boundaries, and you set up the actions for what's going to follow when the boundaries are not honored, and you don't follow through on what you said you're going to do, then you're not setting up a relationship where your students can trust you. So that's a really big part um, of what goes into my practices and all of our teachers you know, who, have we, who Yoga Child has trained. And um, the other piece of that puzzle is that it allows me to feel safe, not just physically safe. Well, sometimes that can be an issue. Most of the time, that's not an issue. But it allows me to feel as though I've protected the sanctity of our class. Because I know that if something goes awry or someone goes astray, exactly what I'm going to do if any one of these obstacles arises, and my students know what I'm going to do, and then they know what action I'm going to ask of them in response. So we all have a plan. It's almost like a fire drill, right? I mean, we have a plan, and that, that allows me to know that I can go in here and, and teach them to use their mind and their body and their breath to help them feel better because I'm, I'm prepared.
to um, go into a, a specific obstacle that we've encountered and just kind of work through solutions for it. Um, I actually think that there are a couple of things that can help um, sort of keep away some of these obstacles that arise. Um, and Gail uh, talked a little bit about rules and boundaries. Uh, we call them a community agreement in my classes uh, because it's really important uh, that uh, we acknowledge that we are a budding community if we aren't quite cohesive yet, but that everybody gives feedback to it. So we start with a blank sheet of paper and we say, okay, how do we respect the space and how do we respect each other? Because respect and disrespect are sort of the, the common vocabulary in the schools that we're working with. And people act upon each other or act out of expectations when they feel disrespected. So we, we really say, you know, this is a place of respect. And everything that they say, we write on the board. If they say, I need to bake the muffins every class, we write it up on the board. You know, if we say, if they say, you know, we, when we come in the room, we have to leave our backpacks outside because we don't know what people carry in their backpacks. I write everything up. They say, okay, we've got a lot here. And this would be a lot for us to all try and do every single time we came here. So how can we sort of minimize what's practical? You know, Miss T has a four-year-old. I can't bake for you every morning. I can't even get her dressed some mornings. <laughs> so that's probably not practical, right? So, but what can we do? What can we do? And so we try to sort of refine it down to a list of no more than seven things, but we vote on them item by item. And this can take some time, right? We try to make it down to seven. So sometimes we're consolidating them and then not, no negativity. So we don't say no talking. We might say one mic, which means one person talks at a time. Right? We don't say, don't do this. We say, you know, um, so we might not say, don't use your cell phone. We say, technology free zone. Right? So we really try to not have words like no or don't or um, anything that seems punitive in nature. And then once we have our seven, and it's okay if it goes to eight or so, nine, oh, it's kind of pushing it. But we, then we have everybody sign it. So they sign this big piece of tag board, and that's the white thing I call that tag board. Um, we have every single person in the class sign it. I take a picture of it, I type it up when I get home, and then I give them each a printed copy the next week, and I make them sign it again. And we actually have workbooks for them. So we glue it onto page eight of their workbook where it says community agreement at the top. Every single class, we read that aloud. Somebody may read all seven of them. We might have two or three students read them, but it's spoken into the room every single time. That's how we start. And that's, that's a real premise, right? And then people start to sort of call out each other. You know, yo, Mike, number five says one person talks at a time, and I'm trying to talk here. So I find that I don't have to sort of monitor so much because they begin to self-monitor amongst themselves. And it really helps because when they start to step outside of that, when they start to sort of have these obstacles surface, I say, but didn't we talk about number three? So it really gives us, it's like um, sounding a singing bowl, right? It, it draws us back. It calls us back when we forget who we are, when we forget where we are. It's a reminder. The other thing that I like to do is shift. So if, if we're feeling like, you know, we've been sitting too long or like people are starting to look at each other the wrong way or they've already thrown a pencil, then I might say, okay, let's do something experiential in nature. Let's get up on our feet. So I have a host of visual metaphors that I work with, experiential exercises that really help to get them involved and show the philosophy behind yoga and mindfulness in a different way. So it, it sort of makes it visual in nature. And I find sort of shifting between the community agreement as a premise and then engaging in these experiential um, activities, visual metaphors, mindfulness comes alive, activities, that it really helps to sort of keep people in a place where we can be respectful and move forward. Even if they don't want to be there, they're still respectful. So we're each going to talk about like one general obstacle, but just so you know, I don't know if you if everybody did grab a handout, but or that book, should I call it that book, okay. thirteen page <laughs> book? Um, the, okay, but there's lots of obstacles in there that we shared with you, so you'll have even more to refer to 
after this. And the tools to overcome those obstacles. And the tool, right. We didn't, <laughs> just, we didn't just list obstacles. There's the tools to overcome those obstacles. Um, so for me, um, the big population that I work with is, is special needs. So um, we can't necessarily do like what Tawana does in her class and have everybody talk about these things because a lot of the kids that I work with are nonverbal. Um, but we sort of do something similar with the teachers <laughs> uh, because sometimes the teachers in the classroom create the greatest obstacles. Um, so what we try to do is either you know, meet with the teachers before so we could talk about how we work and have sort of similar, like you know, common agreements that you're not going to go and you're not going to do the yoga for the kids by moving them and touching their body and you're not going to correct them and you're not going to call out you, go, you know, call to them and tell them to behave and you're not going to be punitive. Um, if you don't do that, then you're going to be pulled out. So we sort of have agreements with the teachers of, and the aides that we're going to be, that we're going to be working with. Um, sometimes I don't have the luxury of meeting with them before, so I actually created a document that I send to them before essentially like thanking them for like thank you for letting us come in and share these practices with you and your and your class um, and just to give you a little bit of information of this is how we um, like to work with you in the classroom we're here to support you but this is how we do it so I sort of make it about them so that it's not threatening to them um, the reason why so this is so important is that when um, when teachers feel threatened by you being there or they feel that you don't have control of the classroom they're gonna immediately take control and they're gonna change everything that you're that you're doing so it's so important for you to have an alliance and the best way to do that is if they get the sense that you're not only there to work with their kids but you're there to help them manage all the things that they are managing and one of the biggest things that they are managing is behavior in these classrooms. That is a common, common theme. Um, and now, b earlier when I spoke, I said, you know, the biggest thing that we need to manage for ourselves is ourself. And if we're able to do that, that seems to handle a lot of the behaviors that are out there. Um, so one of the most important things for us to do is to have our own practice to have something that you do to center yourself yeah <laughs> there's fireworks going off over here um, but I honestly I don't know how anybody can share any of this work if you're not doing the work yourself it doesn't work. It's not yoga and mindfulness that you're bringing. You're bringing a textbook and you're reading from the textbook. You have to embody it in order to share it. And if you truly are embodying it, a lot of the behaviors, especially when you're working with the special needs population, but a lot of the behaviors, they don't really exist. They aren't really there. And part of the reason is that especially again with the special needs population, they're just feeling off of you. They're using your, your energy, your emotional state as their barometer of am I safe here or not? And if you don't feel safe within your own body, then they immediately don't feel safe in theirs. And their behavior is just a reflection of what you are truly feeling within yourself. So it is imperative that you have your own practice and that you are centered and grounded before you walk into any classroom. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just share with you a common obstacle in just a moment, but and it's interesting to me that the common obstacle that I'm going to share with you is sort of smacked me in the face last night at, at midnight. Um, and sometimes, well, I'll tell you the story and then you'll see how it, how it relates. But when I, I'm a very light sleeper and when I travel, I have a, I don't really, I don't have anxiety, but one, if you want to call it anxiety, I might have a little anxiety of will I sleep 
um, in this hotel. So I always request a quiet room, far away from the elevator, and you know, best laid plans. You know, I away from the street, and you know, sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. Well, when I checked in yesterday, I got my quiet room, and I went over to the window, and I saw I was facing the atrium, and I was all the way up on the 15th floor. It was perfect. I was going to get a good night's sleep, so I could be really fresh for everyone today, and. Um, you know, I went to bed early last night and I had fallen asleep for about, you know, maybe 45 minutes or so until there was this thundering sound outside of our door. And it turns out to be some, was anyone on the 15th floor last night making this noise? Okay, <laughs> okay, all right. So um, someone was locked out of their room and I think it was um, maybe a teenager trying to get into their parents' room and they're knocking and they're pounding and this goes on for about a half an hour and then, Dad, let me in. Dad, let me in. Dad, let me in. I'm sure at this point, if you are that person, you're not going to own up. But, <laughs> and, and this goes on for hours until, until you know, my husband and I are thinking, maybe we should call down to the front desk. And you know what? This is crazy. So five and a half hours later, um, sometime around 4.30 or 5 in the morning, I fell asleep for an hour or two. Best laid plans, right? So the obstacle I'm going to talk to you about today is... Um, it's fear of losing control of your class, when you sense you're losing control of your class. And, and really, the, the segue for me from there to here is that so many of um, the rules and the actions that are laid down for you on the second page of the handout and, and much of what Tawana touched upon in the agreement um, that she lays out with her class, so many of those can help to prevent so many of these from happening, right? But not all of the time. Sometimes even our best laid plans, having our agreement in place, having all of our rules and actions in place are not going to prevent problems from arising as I encountered um, last night and early this morning. So what, what do we do then? What do we do when we find ourselves in that space? And I wanted to address this issue because I think for new teachers, especially if you aren't coming to being a yoga teacher, if you're not coming from an educational background and you're not used to managing a group of children in a room alone, that can be the most frightening thing. I had so many trainees um, say to me as they're getting ready to go into the apprenticeship program, you know, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to manage this class. You know, what if the, the what if the assistant, you know, who's supposed to be in the room doesn't show up, or what if this happens, or what if that happens? And part of the, a biggest part of the training for us is really helping teachers to get confident in that space. But what happens when everything that you have laid out can't be used for whatever reason? So, and what does it look like when we lose control of a class? And the words, I, I, if you notice, I didn't say when we lose control of our class was the obstacle. I said when we fear we're losing control of our class or when we sense we're going to lose control of our class because that's the time to take action. We don't want to wait and, and watch because then it becomes really challenging. But what, what can we do there, and what does that look like? So in my mind, um, a class that's about to, you know, I'm going to, let's talk about maybe a K through five class. I really love teaching to those students. I find them to be very teachable, very easy to engage. And um, if they're not eagerly joining in from the beginning, eventually they, they, they always do sort of gravitate towards the yoga. I really, that might be my, shh, my, favorite, my favorite age to teach. But, so you're, you're teaching your class, and maybe it's a day where you have 80% of your students' attention. And you can accept that, right? You're, it's OK. Things are going along smoothly. And right? so, so you're, you're doing that, and then um, a student comes in from the nurse's office. And when that student comes in from the nurse's office, two kids over in this corner decide they want to switch mats because this one has a better color than that one. And while that student's working his way back to his seat, he trips over someone's wrist, and that makes a little scuffle arise. And then you've got a student over here who's using this opportunity to pick her nose. And then in this corner, you have a kid who's just kind of humming. And now you've got a child laying down on their mat to take a nap in the back. So this is, not, this is not a tremendous amount of noise, but this is enough that you you've now don't have the majority of your class's attention. And the way you handle this here can be, you can handle this in a way where you add to the chaos, or you can handle this in a way where you mindfully redirect your group without raising your voice, without doing anything to contribute to the noise level in the room, and you do so in a way that refocuses everyone's attention so that when you're done drawing them back to where they need to be, they're primed 
to move on because their attention is, is refocused. So how do we do that? Um, I like to speak in acronyms because it helps me when I'm working with my students, but it also helps me when I'm educating educators because then I can remember for, for teaching. So I use M&Ms. Um, there's not just two, there's three, so M and M and M. <laughs> the first M that I like to do and that I like to suggest that, that teachers do when they find themselves in this situation is to take a moment of mindfulness. What does that look like? Do you close your eyes and meditate for a minute? No, I mean, you, you're not going, I mean, you, do you, get the gremlins wet? No. So what are, you, what are you going to do with that moment? For some of us, it might be as simple as acknowledging what we're feeling. I'm feeling self-doubt. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling worried. I'm feeling excited. Now I get to use the tools that I learned to use in this situation. I've got this. I wish I was never a yoga teacher. Whatever it is, <laughs> acknowledge it and own it. It only takes a moment. And if, you, if, if, if that feels too busy for you, then just breathe in, breathe out, now go. You stop and then you go. So when you stop, what comes next? Mark the moment. Mark the moment. That's our second M. Mark the moment. What does this mean? This just means that we make a mental impression of what's happening and when it happened so that we can return to it later and reflect upon it. There might be something to learn here. There might be something here that's going, that I'm going to discover in hindsight that I can't see now because it's too cloudy. There's too much going on. And it might be something that's going to help me become a better teacher. Maybe there was something that you could have done differently Maybe there's something you chose to do. Maybe it wasn't a great idea to start with energy games today. Um, or maybe it had absolutely nothing to do with you and was just the circumstances that I had presented. Either way, mark the moment so you can return to it later. And then the third M, mindfully redirect your students. So what does that look like? Mindfully redirecting your students. It can be as simple as, but maybe you have to do it again because these two are still arguing. You may have to do it one more time. I, I, I don't ever like to be, I don't like to be anywhere without my singing bowl, but I don't like to be, um, I don't like to be in a yoga class without some sounding aid. It's a wonderful tool and even the students who maybe have never, maybe you haven't used it in your class yet, Maybe you haven't even had time to introduce it to the class. But that sound coming out of the class in a moment like that is going to draw everyone's attention to you without you having to do very much. That's probably, um, many of you probably already do this and know this. How many of you have done? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not rocket science. But sometimes it's easy to forget these things. We know, have all these tools. And then time passes and you stop bringing it with you for a few weeks and then it collects dust and you were running late and you don't have it and then you just forget about it. So don't forget about the use of sound for redirection. Similarly, um, we do, I'll call it chanting right now, but it's non-denominational chanting with the use of sound vibration. It's a second way I like to mindfully redirect. And if you can all take your first two fingers and put them on your, um, on your vocal cords. Now turn to a neighbor or someone in front of you or behind you, or if someone's far away, you can be loud and just say something. Hi, how are you? Your hair looks pretty. Are you having fun? <laughs> okay. okay. So, so you feel that vibration, right? So now bring your fingers back up there and we're all going to chant um, a farm animal chant together. We're going to chant moo, okay? So are you ready? Take a deep breath in. So feeling that while you're, while you're projecting it out, is you're sort of having two, two sensory experiences at once. And if, even if you've never done farm animal chants with your students in class before, if you do something like that, we have, we have a couple on the Yoga Child CD, um, you can find it on iTunes and just download that song if you, if you want. Um, don't even need to get the whole album. But 
if you do something like that, the students who are paying attention, maybe the 10 kids who are still with you or the you know, 20% of the kids who are still listening, they're going to join in and do it with you because their eyes are on you. And then the other kids are going to slowly begin to stop and wonder what the sound is. And some of them are going to join in too. And then the other ones, best case scenario, they're going to join in because they don't want to feel left out. Or they're just going to stop being disruptive and look at you like you're a little strange and wonder what's going on. But then you have their attention and you don't need to raise your, raise your voice. Um, I always say to my students in the beginning of the year when we're going over the rules, and you'll see some of this on the second page of the handout when you have a chance to look at it, that I don't like to raise my voice. It doesn't feel good for me, and I know it doesn't feel good for you. And we set up lots of different alternatives and things that we can do in the classroom if I ever sense that I'm going to need to rein in everyone's attention. So um, the rules and actions that you see on page two of the handout are really ideal for a situation where you have one child um, that you need to address, or two children, or maybe a child with a repeat performance each week each week that needs to be addressed. But in the out of control situation where, every, where you need to do some sweeping gesture, um, the third way I like to mindfully redirect, and then I'll wrap this up because it feels like I've been talking for a very long time. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the, the third way is with um, what I call active pranayama. So it's something that involves um, breath and movement. And you know, an example might be something like, like this. sort of um, going, going awry, you're going to have that same experience that you do with the, with the fingers on the vocal cords. People are going to start following and joining in, and the last man out is not going to want to feel like the last kid out. They'll either join in or they'll stop and look at you again, wondering what's going on. In order for that to be effective, it helps if when you're setting your ground rules in the beginning of the year, you let them know. There's this one very special um, asana I'm going to reserve for times when I feel that I don't have everyone's attention. You'll demonstrate it then, and then when you start doing it on that given day, they'll all be excited to join in. So that's it for the three M's. And I think now we're going to be led on a little exercise that calls on all of you. Oh, OK. So um, what we wanted to do was sort of guide you through an experience of reflecting upon an obstacle, but we also um, know that this is a discussion and we want to hear from the wisdom in the room and see what questions that you have as well. Um, so as uh, people are beginning to ask questions or bring up experiences, just you know, take a moment to feel your feet on the ground and just notice if there's something that comes up for you, an, an obstacle that you faced in the class that you're just not sure you um, knew how to handle in the moment and just sort of reflect upon what that was like, what you felt in your body, what was happening in your mind, what was happening in your heart. And as we begin this sharing process, if you wanna share that experience that surfaced for you, or if you want to just ask a question, uh, we would love to move into more of a discussion with you. Um, so we're gonna pass the mic. Hello. Yeah. OK. Um, so thank you again for sharing. I had a follow up question about um, the fear of losing, not the fear of losing control, sorry, when the teacher is shouting over, um, you know, the instructor and sort of how to balance that. Can you give like maybe one tangible tip? tip? I know um, you mentioned going in and just having that initial conversation to say this is, you know, we understand that these are the behaviors and expectations in the classroom. Um, this is what we expect, and do you have any other tips or tricks? Because we actually ran into this last week where I got an SOS from one of my instructors saying the teacher is being hostile, and I was like, okay, that's clearly not what we want. Um, so any like tangible, you know, what kind of conversation did you have, um, or what tips do you have just to push it a little bit further? Yeah, 
if you've already like had the conversation with them before and it's still happening um, first I would say just revisit it like talk to the get to them again after um, another thing that works sometimes is telling them you know what when I'm he when I'm here why don't you enjoy the yoga with the kids like here's the mat I know how much you have to manage all day long it's okay with me if you're laying down on the mat you don't have to feel like you need to be in control like I've got this they have to believe that you've got it that you are okay that you could stand in your power and and feel confident that you can handle whatever happens you know it it's also you, you have to remember where they're coming from like sometimes I'm walking into a school building and the minute I walk through those doors I can feel this rush of intense dis-ease and whenever I start to feel that I start like walking to the classroom I'm feeling my feet on the floor I'm pacing my breath I'm filling myself up with each breath of I am bringing like love and light into this room and I'm sending it to the teacher even b before I get there um, because there are classrooms that I'm in the teachers needs what I'm bringing more than the students and here's another thing that I always remember that when I walk out that door those kids are left with that teacher so it's as important that I'm reaching the teacher at that as I'm as I'm reaching the kids I don't leave the teachers out of of that um, a follow-up to that so that's that's actually um, great advice and I think um, the, the flip side of that is when you have a disengaged adult in the room right so whether it's the aide or the teacher who whoever it is like we in our program we have a you know it's part of our guidelines that an adult must be present in the room so and typically it's the classroom teacher or the aide um, we can't we can't force anyone to do anything right so we can't force them to get on the mat we can't force them to even sit on the chair and breathe with us though we highly recommend it so what um, what has worked in your programs when you have that disengaged adult who's responsible for the classroom and you know they might be the opposite where like stuff is going down over here and they're like you know on Facebook or Twitter or whatever they're doing I don't know but like you know they're just and whether or not they need it like we know that everyone could benefit but they might not be bought in yet so what what advice do you have for that um, all right, so I'll, I'll to keep it short so that you can add to I and mean, we have had situations where we've had to have a meeting with the teacher and the principal or and the special ed director or and the superintendent just to go over again why I am there and it's not that because you're doing this it's just a reminder that I'm there for this purpose and I have a role when I'm there and they have a role when they're there um, and they just they need to hear it from somebody else of authority that they would listen to because again you know, we we've had that situation like my teachers walk in I have a teacher here right now who called me after the first day I walked in and all the age just popped on their phone and the teacher was right behind the desk and this is a special ed classroom she said and it was crazy I'm like oh no that's not gonna happen <laughs> um, and that actually was a situation where we first went to the teacher reminded like remember this is why I'm here and this is how we work together and it ended up going to the point where we had to do a meeting with all the teachers and the principal as yes and thanked us thanked us so much but again it wasn't a meeting with the principal because this is what you're you know you're tuning out when I walk in the door it's just like this is just like a, a reminder again so that we can just have a discussion without the kids around without it being rushed about how we're here to work with you to support you to help you and even to open up the discussion of is there any other way you would like us to to help you and sometimes in those situations 
things will come up from the teacher of something else that's bothering them about you being there that you had no idea about and they never would have offered it to you. So just to give you a quick for example, um, I had one teacher that just gave me such attitude every time I was in her room and it came to we had to have a meeting with the principal and what was really bothering her was that I moved a table in her room about one foot over so that the kids had more room on the carpet and I didn't move it back. I'm like, I wish you would have told me. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. You're right. I should have moved that back. And I will never leave without rearranging the, the room again. I, I'm sorry about that. And it, that changed everything. So. I think this role clarification uh, that Allison is talking about is really helpful. Um, I find if it can occur without an administrator, it's helpful just because uh, we then perpetuate the hierarchical nature of educational environments. Um, and, and so then there's a little bit of like resentment in the belly from the teacher that, that we had to get to that place. So um, we do feedback forms monthly to the teachers and we say, okay, you know, let us know how we're doing. Let us know what you think the kids are receiving. Let us know if there's something else that you want us to do differently and we take that in. So we got a message like Allison got, you moved my stuff and you didn't move it back. We went in there and we taped, we put a piece of tape at every table, every desk. And she loved it because she was a precise person. And so she appreciated us meeting her where she was, which is the place of, you know, acute precision. And so I find if you can meet them where they are, you know, if you can speak to them in their language, if you can offer support, um, often, you know, just saying, we're willing to come 20 minutes before school starts or come here half an hour afterwards and we'll do a stress reduction or a yoga class for your staff. They would appreciate that, right? So just giving them opportunities to come on board at their own pace, but also acknowledging that silence can be really challenging for people. Um, I've had teachers say, I don't know what happens when they're quiet. At least when they're making noise, I know what's going on in the room. And so it's, it sort of scared her because she was dealing with some volatile children. And so, you know, knowing that is helpful. Right? Or just, I've actually said, I know we took your planning period. I know they're usually in art right now and now you're forced to stay with them. If you've got a test that you really need to correct, I'm okay with that. And I find, and because we engage in co-teaching, we already have two adults in the room and they're helpful if we say, you know, Miss Ingalls, can you please work with Tommy a little bit so that we can focus in on this class? They're willing to do that on a sort of one-to-one -one basis. but. Often we've taken their planning period, the only period they get that day. And so that's hard. It's hard going in in that space. Question? Any other questions? Thank you. Um, and this is a really helpful session, so thank you for all your experience. Um, I have a group of about 20 K through two kids that we teach after school and we've had we've had great success in bringing lots of the children back whether th it's through their own uh, volition or whether it's their parents just you know signing them up time and time again I'm not sure really um, but there's three little girls that most of the time are really delightful but they do tend to there's two of them that tend to kind of leave the third one out and I wondered if you had any strategies on dealing with that kind of um, kind of isolation in some ways. Um, I, we've tried separating them so their mats aren't next to one another. We've tried, um, I, I don't know, we've tried a number of different strategies, but uh, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a palpable, palpable thing in the room, so it's not, it would be good if we could, you know, work to eliminate it, but it's, uh, these, these little girls, bless them, they keep coming back every session and we love having them, but, you know, it's kind of a thing now, so I don't know if there's, any help you can offer. That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's terrible to watch a child being left out. It doesn't feel good for anyone, um, especially that child. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, what the leaving out looks like? Um, well, for example, they'll, um, you know, they'll kind of 
conspire, if that's the right word, I'm not sure, to um, make sure that they're, if they're in a partnership or if we par partner the kids up or if we you know, invite group work, um, that she's very much excluded, that she's... And then the thing is that some weeks, the three of them are, are very close. Um, and I know, you know, we all know, we've probably all been there, that in, when you're in a threesome mm -hmm. <laughs> amongst yes. friends, it's, it can be tricky, but they'll, they'll just um, deliberately not talk to her during class or, or kind of if we're doing partner work, they'll, they'll okay. separate themselves. Okay. I've got a, a couple concrete things that you might want to try out. Um, first is I would just, I, and when you organize your class, you may for a few weeks want to reorganize your class so that you're limiting the amount of interactive time and opportunity there is for the students to interact with each other so that they're more focused on, on what you're teaching and what you're doing rather than doing partner work with each other. But if you do decide to do partner work, if, you, if you're doing any type of partner work or interactive work, and I mean, this is, I think, a, a lovely opportunity for you, to, for you to pair up who goes with who, and then you can choose. You could perhaps have the one child who's left at feeling left out work with one of the girls who's been leaving her out. Um, and you could then the following week have her work with the other girl who's been leaving her out and make sure those two girls who have been leaving her out are maybe working with some other people in the room as well. Um, there are lots of different partner, um, partner activities and yoga themes that you could build your class around um, that have to do with in sort of cultivating compassion towards others and thinking about how other children are feeling based on our actions. So if we can get those girls thinking about how their actions are making other people feel without directing it specifically to them, but within the classroom concept, that may help. You also, I know you said you tried separating them. One of the tactics I like to use, especially with um, K through five students, is to reposition myself. And there's a note about that in the, in the paperwork as well, in the pamphlet, the encyclopedia, the booklet, the dictionary. Um, if you just walk over when you're teaching, when you see this going on and you just sit yourself down and your new teaching spot, do you teach in a circle or yes. do you, yes. you put yourself right in between them and you sit there for a little bit, they'll get the message. Um, you could also invite the girl who's feeling left out to take a special role in the class one day. If you ever have activities what, that are student led, let her feel special, let her feel empowered. Yes, that, that last one is a really nice idea, I think. I mean, we this whole thing has spurred us to introduce a kindness challenge to them next week actually in our class where they're gonna have 30 days of, of kindness and encourage them to um, do something nice for other people so it you know we are trying to work towards that mm -hmm. philosophy introducing mm -hmm. kindness yeah in and the there's classroom. many books you can use yes. with that as well yeah. to incorporate in so yeah. they can just kind of let it flow right in and then thank come you. out the other end. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very You're much. You're welcome. I hope it's helpful. This is awesome. Thank you so much. I'm just thrilled. I, you've alluded a little bit to kind of the apprenticeship or how you're preparing your teachers to go in. Can you each talk about what that looks like? I mean, you, you have your trainings, but what kind of follow-up? How are you really preparing the teachers to come in? briefly or if we have time thank you um, for us we're a small group of teachers so my main thing is um, I make sure that our teachers are really qualified like over qualified by some standards <clears throat> and I make sure that we have a continual open dialogue. So if there's, e like they're responsible for emailing teachers if there's an issue or where we have to shift something by 10 minutes or whatever, I'm always CC'd on it. So I'm always kept in the loop, but I try to empower them to, they're the first line so if there's anything going on in the classroom, I don't want those classroom teachers contacting me about things. It goes, it goes to the teacher, our teacher in the classroom first, and they handle it there. But anytime that there's like emails going back and forth, I'm always CC'd and I always, like we have a heads up. I always want, I always want a heads up. And if there's something happening that you even question 
we we talk about it. So I've had sometimes teachers call me like, I, I, I got to tell you what happened in the classroom and they're telling this whole thing. And I'm like, uh, okay, I think you're, you're totally over um, reacting to it and you're identifying with something that's not really there. Um, but how about like, we'll construct an email to the teacher together, you know, together um, and let's see where, where it goes. Um, so I guess those are like the, the first one, it's like you're, you're overqualified <laughs> for it. I just make sure that they have a ton of training and that we just constantly have this open line of communication that they can come to me with anything, I can help guide them, but you're empowered to, to really handle the things that, that are going on in the classroom. So I, I'd actually, um, you know, like Allison is saying, expect someone to come with pretty high qualifications. Um, and, I, and so I feel like my role is to offer cultural competence training because we are usually working in predominantly people of color communities. Um, and as reflected in this room, most of my teachers don't look like the people that we're serving. Um, and this is still just a struggle for the yoga and meditation community. Uh, and so uh, that is so important. And so we, we talk about where they are. We talk about their fears, right? We put it all on the table in a very sort of raw, heartful, you know, tearful conversation. And we get it out. Like, this is what I'm bringing. This is what my experience has been. This is what I'm scared of. And then, you know, I have lots and lots of videos, and we show them videos of where the kids live. We show them videos of their struggles. We show them videos of what they probably witness on a day-to-day -day basis, like high levels of violence. And we say, okay, now do you still want to be here? And once they still want to be here, I say, I'm, I'm in with you. You know, you call me anytime. I meet with each of them weekly, one-on-one -on -one for half an hour. And we say, okay, this is what I got to in my lesson. This is what I didn't get to yet. Uh, you know, here's sort of the uh, qualities of mindfulness that I brought forth, and we have a checklist that we go through. Here's what I'm still working on, and here's what I need you to do. And so, you know, I will jump into a classroom with them. I will um, come into the classroom, and they'll sort of just take a step back and kind of bear witness to the a process. But we really work together. And then I send them on retreats. I say, please take care of yourself, or I'll say, don't go in tomorrow. I saw what happened. Let me do it instead. You know, so just to like give them space, right? They need as much spaciousness as they can physically and internally so that they can support these young people that are having, facing such great difficulty. Um, so that's, that's really the approach that we take. I love how I'm finding out how we're more and more similar as these questions come about. Um, so at, at Yoga Child, we have a very selective process as well. Um, the apprenticeship is the second level of our teacher training. Uh, we used to, I used to personally interview every single person who wanted to come into our teacher training, and we used to have prerequisites um, for them in terms of their, their background and, and Either they had to be an adult yoga teacher or a background in education. And about six or seven years ago, we, we modified it so that the training is open to anyone. And we basically set it up so that the first 50 hours of training is, is an in, you're, you know, you're, it's in, in training, physical training in the, in the room with us. And during that time, we have classroom visits where they, we go into the classroom, into the schoolroom, and we watch our, te our teachers, our lead teachers in action. And then when that phase of the training is over, we have an, the level two is optional. It's called the apprenticeship. And what used to be mandatory, they used to, it used to be all blended together in one training. Um, if someone wants to work for Yoga Child as a teacher, they must go through the second level, which is the apprenticeship, where they are assigned a mentor. And our lead mentor is right over there, Maureen. Hi. Um, and everyone, everyone is assigned um, a mentor who they go into the classroom with for a three-month period and they do um, apprenticeship assistance and they work their way into teaching slowly teaching bit by bit taking on more responsibilities each week until the end of their apprenticeship when they're ready to fully teach a class all of their assignments are completed I come in and observe the final few classes and then at that point we then talk about 
uh, you know, working for Yoga Child and, and moving forward. And yes, it's, it's the level two of our training. It's field experience. It's in the field training under the supervision of, of a teacher who can help them along the way. Are there any other questions? Um, hi. Um, hi. So I am a counselor at a charter high school in Albuquerque, and I've been working there about seven years. Um, this is my eighth year. And then I'm also trained as an adult yoga teacher. And we've had a yoga club for several years after school. And then this, this year, the principal asked me to put the cl a class on the actual schedule, um, which is awesome. And it's seventh period. We meet four times a week. It's a significant amount of time. It's three days for 55 minutes, and then one day we don't meet, and then the other day it's a 95-minute block. And so I'm really fortunate, and I have a really supportive you know, principal and administration. But I have to issue grades, and <laughs> because it's a credit-generating class. And so I'm like, oh my. Like, how do I measure these things in a way? And I think grades are valuable. I want to really honor them for their time, their commitment, for the specific skills that I'm really actually trying to teach. And yet at the same time, as we know in our own yoga practice, it looks so different any given day. Like my full on participation might be literally crying on my mat one day and like rocking an arm balance the next day. So I'm struggling with how to measure it. And to be honest, parent teacher conferences are a Wednesday and I've entered zero grades so far at all. So any suggestions you guys have yeah. about how to uh, measure? Well, I, I would say stuff. anybody that walks through your door, if they walk through the door and they show up, they get an A. You just have to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, did anybody else want to take that? Or did you want to add something? Oh, yeah. oh thank you. Um, well, I used to teach yoga as a, a course, but it was a college course. So it was different, but it was, you know, graded. And so um, one of the things, the big thing for me was attendance. That was huge, just exactly as Allison said. And then the other part was um, projects. So a project where they would show how they implement yoga in some other aspect of their life um, would be one outside of school. And then another one would be how they implement yoga within the school. So, you know, just to, um, and, and, and it could be a project of any form. It could be art, it could be written, it could be or oral. And so it um, made it much easier because I had to have some kind of grading tool for that work for me. is a, a wonderful way of just, you know, um, building a reflection piece, and it's also something that you can monitor. Um, you can have them build a vision board as one of their projects, right, where they're just cutting out images that inspire them, words, pictures, they can make it themselves. I mean, that can be something that they do. Um, I often ask students, go home and teach someone this. Go home and do mindful walking with someone. Teach someone eating meditation. And if they tell me that they did it, I'm good with that. I also have a CD that every student gets, and I say, you have to listen to this CD and come back to me with a question, this track, and come back with a question the following week. So just little, and I know CDs are ancient. I hold them up and people are like, what is that? <laughs> but, um, but we still have them. So, um, but just sort of giving them something, but really showing up is 90% of it, right? And then. The, you know, the creative projects that they can kind of do along the way. I w taught at a community college for a while, and it was tricky. I, I just want to add one, um, one element onto what we're talking about, and I thank you for bringing this up because it sort of evaded me when I was thinking about responses to, what, what is your name? To Kristen's question. Um, we have something that we call taking yoga home, and it's how we end every single class that we teach. And it's where we sort of uh, draw out um, some sort of overriding theme from the day's class, whether it was using a, a magical meditation to help manage our emotions, whether it was cultivating compassion. And we have a way of giving them an assignment, basically, to um, much in the way you were each speaking about, to, to take that home with them. If they're younger, when they, we ask them when they come back the next day to follow up with their teacher. We, with preschoolers and kindergartners, will we don't expect them to hold on to it for a week. But when we come back the following week with our older children, we always follow up on the assignment in an active way in class with our breathing ball, which is a little different than the breathing balls that go like this, 
we use the breathing ball to teach um, to teach a deep in breath in sync with the movement. So we're breathing in and lifting our arms up, holding a ball that's shoulders width apart, and exhaling down. And that gives all of our students a chance to greet the group for the day and explain sort of how they use their taking yoga home exercise over the week. And it sort of allows you to um, to get a measure and see what's going on, or they can follow, or they can write it in their yoga journal. We use the yoga journals as a place for those for those um, sort of kinds of questions and contemplations as well. But I would, I would always, I, I would sort of back up what Allison and Tawana said that I would never grade on those, but I would use them to sort of measure participation because you know one student's one student might be more emotionally able to access things while another student isn't, and we don't want to penalize anyone for that. It's the last thing they need, right? So I, I'm all for the A's for everyone who shows up. So we're going to um, close with a little bit of metta here. So if you can just feel your feet on the ground and sit in a way that um, shows that you're proud of who you are, whatever that means to you. And I say it that way because I used to say sit like a king or queen might sit on his or her throne, and they would do this. <laughs> right? So now I'm like, sit like you're proud of who you are. And they usually sit up a little bit more. All right, so finding your feet on the ground, if it's comfortable for you, allowing your eyes to close. If that doesn't feel comfortable, just make sure you're not staring at a person or an object. <sighs> just letting your shoulders fall away from your ears for a moment. So I'll sound one bell at the beginning and three at the end. So just taking a moment to envision a student that may have caused a challenge for you, that may have made you forget who you were. And really take a moment to see that student in your mind's eye. And then silently to yourself offering them these words. May you be well. May you be healthy and happy. May you know peace and ease. May you be free from suffering and danger. May you be filled with loving kindness. And repeat those phrases to this person, this student, one more time. Just noticing any moments where it feels difficult for you. And with the next exhale, letting that student go, but keeping them in your heart. And now seeing an image of yourself in your mind's eye and offering yourself these same wishes. May I 
be well. May I be healthy and happy. May I know peace and ease. May I be free from suffering and danger. May I be filled with loving kindness. And then finally, extending those wishes to everyone in this room, to everyone in this building, to everyone in this city and beyond. May all beings be well. May all beings be healthy and happy. May all beings know peace and ease. May all beings be free from suffering and danger. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. feel ready letting your eyes open thank you so much thank you thank you and if you didn't get a handout a book as we've been calling them yeah. All of the materials should be up front, as well as some information about upcoming trainings. And we'll be here if people have more questions that didn't get answered. Thank you so much.